Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Friday webinar. We are with uh, back with Dr. Tom Tolley for Ask the Vet. Hey, Dr. Tolley. <laughs> I love your ooh, the, <laughs> the mystical hand. Um, so, you know, I, I'm going to ask you, how's the weather in your parts? And there's a reason why I'm going to ask why, how the weather is in your area. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's springtime. Yes, Yay. it is. It is 70 degrees. They call it, uh, what do they call it? Um, uh, you know, um, some kind of a weather, a chamber of commerce weather. Oh. You know, yes, okay. yes, when it's so nice. So people would say, oh, well, that's a beautiful place to live. <laughs> now, now in July, not chamber of commerce weather. <laughs> Is it like hot and, and humid? humid? Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, last week we were on with uh, Lisa Bono and uh, she had a severe storm that rolled through and we lost connection with her for a, a good, I don't know, 15, 10, 15 minutes. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, no internet. So, so. Uh, well, we're yeah. in good shape this, this week. We're, yeah. <laughs> no, no problem. Had a little tornado uh, in New Orleans, which is somewhat unusual, but uh, they've had them before. But uh, nonetheless, uh, all of that weather pushed out and now it's very clear sunny and 70 degrees so there you go. okay okay so we will be good to go uh, for this session of our webinar um so we're gonna i know we're gonna have a lot of questions as usual for you on um, on the ask the vet and just a quick reminder everybody that if you have a question for dr foley to use the q a button um chat one q a button if you have a question and um Let's let's see what we got. Well, I'm sure we're gonna have a. Oh, we got people giving us their weather. Oh wow. Okay. So do you want to just dive? We'll dive right in because um, I got a. I got a. I'm gonna put my glasses on for this. <laughs> this one looks long. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. Let's, okay. Let's, let's go. This is from Jane. Um, has an eight year old budgie that's developed a mass that appears to be a, a xanthoma. That's with mm. an X uh, on the left wing and is currently about three eighths of an inch in diameter and raised about a quarter of an inch. He's extremely stressed during the exam, so a needle biopsy was not done. And the vet said he's in very a very bad location for removal without a partial wing amputation, mm -hmm. um, which would most likely be the humerus slash ulna joint. Um, mm -hmm. Wing hangs at his side while he's perched. He's still flying and acting normal other than the preening the area a lot. And so the vet said it's probably the feathers growing in the mass that are annoying him and that's why he's you know, chewing them, and he's on currently on meloxicam. Mm -hmm. Since uh, xanthomias are xanthomas are fatty in nature, would a restricted diet and weight loss halt the growth, or would it be of any help? So, what are your thoughts on surgery for an eight-year-old budgie? And um, there, is there a specific uh, surgical technique that you'd recommend? That's that's well, um, that's a good question. Uh, as far as xanthomas are concerned. Um, they are a, uh, a fatty, uh, fatty tumor, um, but it is a little bit more complex, has a little bit more complexity than just a lipoma, which are is a strictly fatty, fatty growth. Um, and budgies can get lipomas or xanthomas. Xanthomas many times are uh, colored uh, a yellowish or a, a light orange color. Um, and, 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 and so, uh, that's, that's what, what you are looking at with a xanthoma, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, a needle aspirate, um, is something that I always, and that's sticking a needle into a, a mass and pulling back on the syringe to get some of that content of that mass in the needle and then putting it on a slide. So a clinical pathologist can look at those cells and try to determine what it is. However, just as you can imagine, pulling out cells in a needle sometimes isn't very diagnostic, um, or often it isn't. Um, I always say a needle aspirate will give you a diagnosis about 30, 25, 35% of the time. Uh, a, a definitive diagnosis. Uh, often we get needle aspirates back that are non-diagnostic, recommend a biopsy, you know? So, uh, but it's so easy and it, and, and it can provide a uh, definitive diagnosis that 
it's, it's often it's the first uh, recommendation uh, to give. And, and it doesn't really stress the animal out very much, as you can imagine, just sticking a needle in and trying to aspirate it or suck up uh, cells. Um, it doesn't appear that this was done. It, it appears that, you know, that determined that it was a xanthoma. Um, the location is, is, is problematic. It's in the elbow joint. Can you imagine having something in your elbow joint and it's just like you can't move your arm and it's not just the feathers. It's just, I want to fly, but I want to, you know, flap, but you know, something's bothering me. The feathers can be because it, it can distort the feather growth. With that all in mind, and, and what you have, meloxicam, meloxicam, uh, medicam is a, an NSAID, um, and there are different forms of uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Uh, one was mentioned, uh, I just wasn't familiar with, it was a, uh, more of a companion animal. We had a question on lymphoma uh, treatment uh, last month, and and uh, it was being provided to the to the bird uh, for anti-inflammatory properties. To, and again, if you have Advil, Tylenol, something like that, it just makes you feel better. Um, and so that's what this this is um, the the budgies uh, currently being treated with. Now, <clears throat> what can you do? You're a veterinarian. You're un, you know you're getting excellent care for your bird. Um, and they are correct um, in, the, in the, that it is a very difficult place to remove that from the, the body uh, completely. Um, and it may be incorporated around or within that joint. So you're really not going to get a lot of, um, uh, I guess, uh, benefit other than just removing a lot of the mass. Not that it'll regrow, uh, necessarily uh, to the size it is, um, but it is potential. It has the potential to do that. Um, so therefore, a wing amputation at the middle of the humerus uh, is, is usually uh, recommended in, in situations like this. Now, uh, Laura had a little budgie uh, just a few minutes ago, it's probably right, right around there somewhere, but the, <clears throat> they're only 30 grams, 30 to 40 grams. So they're very small. Um, if, uh, you know, with being able to amputate it, the mid humerus is, is fairly, um, uh, as far as surgical techniques go, it's fairly a, a, an easy surgery to do. And if it is done, um, the budgie uh, will, will not fly. I can guarantee you that it will not fly, but it, it'll have a great quality of life. And you can't really, when the budgie's just perching, it looks, it looks relatively normal. Um, I've always, if, if there's the, a wing amputation is a, a, um, really a recommendation to treat any injury. Um, it's always very difficult to say, oh, you got to amputate a wing. Ah, you know, it's just hard decision to make. And I've gone through this with many, many bird owners over the years. And um, when, when it, it, and then I tell, I tell the owners that the way at the mid shaft and the uh, humeral amputation that when it heals, the birds look like they have a wing. You, you don't see feathers sticking out. You don't see anything. And it's, and it, and it's very aesthetically uh, normal. And it really doesn't bother the bird other than it can't fly. Um, so it is a, a, a it, it, and after it's done, Although it's it's very difficult uh, to to really say I'm going to agree to have the, the the wing amputated, but it's the best for the bird. They're they're always like, yes, it it it, it looks good. You know, it looks good. There's no problems, no issues. 
you have a 30, you have an eight year old budgie, you have, it's only 30 to 40 grams. It, it is a surgery that is, is, has risk involved. There are risks um, uh, with anesthesia, going through the surgery. Um, uh, and again, uh, just with any, but you know, if I have to amputate a leg on a budgie, I have to amputate a wing on a budgie. I go into the surgery with saying, I can't lose any blood. I can't lose any blood. And can you imagine any surgeon going into surgery saying, I can't lose a drop of blood? You do have three tenths to four tenths of a mil to work with. That's uh, almost half of a mil, but that's, that's not a lot. Uh, so you have to be very careful uh, if the, the, the veterinarian's uh, uh, confident, um, and, and, and knowledgeable, um, then that goes a long way as far as wing amputation goes. It goes a long way in, in, in uh, the, the, uh, the, the reducing the risk of the surgery uh, procedure. Uh, so that's something to uh, discuss with, but it, it appears that the bird is under, under very good care. One thing that I do want to mention about lipomas and xanthomas, uh, there's things uh, over time, and you kind of mentioned this about uh, high fat diets, the seed diets, and this has been perpetuated for 50, 60, 30, 40 years, that if you reduce the amount of uh, food, uh, fat in the diet and keep the bird <clears throat> uh, relatively on a, uh, uh, a good body condition and not, not over conditioned that, um, that will, uh, reduce the, the, the chance of, of these developing and that, that, that may be true, reduce the chance of the development. What I do not believe is that once they occur, that they will shrink. Okay. And go away on their own. Uh, so whatever it's there, you could possibly reduce the chance of those developing by having a lower fat diet. But as far as the shrinkage or something of that nature, I don't think that that's, in my mind, I don't see them just like, oh, well, I've got them on a good diet, so, you know, uh, good condition now, they're gone, they, they, they'll disappear. Um, that, that tumor has developed and, uh, I don't see it just like shrinking away because of a dietary change. How's that? That's, that's very uh, thorough. And I, you know, I had a follow-up question for birds that do have, uh, wing amputations, um, accommodating them, like in their cage, do you recommend, are the, do you place the perches any differently or do you add more ladders, more ropes, more climbing opportunities or? For wing amputations, uh, I don't really, <clears throat> they get around very well. They get around very well. For leg amputations, it's a different story. I try to, because their beak is another appendage. And we all know that, right? We, they climb, they, 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 and so, you know, I've amputated uh, not many uh, legs on birds, but I have. And the birds learn to accommodate with those, but I do recommend platforms and, and, and kind of a lower and making it easier for that bird to get around in the cage. Um, and the wing amputations, um, <clears throat> there have been, there's more uh, issues that come with the wings than with the legs as far as amputations uh, occur. Uh, you know, are, are involved. So, and, and really we, we don't try to amputate if we do, that's the last, really it's, it's really a quality of life issue and it's the last resort. I do not want to amputate if I don't have to, um, but um, with the wings, the birds do fantastic. They really do, uh, Laura, that's a great question. Um, but, um, the leg, uh, leg amputation does require a little bit of, um, kind of 
making the environment more accommodating. Okay. Um, and this question comes from Nan. Um, weighs there Amazon every day? There seems to be quite a wide fluctuation in her weight, sometimes just a couple of grams, other times as much as 15 grams over a week or so. How do you interpret the numbers on the scale over time to monitor for illness? So what do you, how do you interpret that fluctuating gram numbers over the course of the week? Well, that's, a, that's, a, that's an excellent question as, as uh, all, of, all of them are and uh, really appreciate those. Um, because it gets down to, it gets down back to my my point of um, uh, of assessing of assessing your birds, your bird or birds. Um, you know, we we all hear and read again about well, birds are prey species. They hide their signs. Well, they don't hide the signs from this questioner here. You see. This questioner uh, weighs the bird on a daily basis and, 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 and is, is interactive and, and, and knows how that bird acts, what the bird's normal disposition is, what the normal stool looks like, what it normally eats, how much it eats. I can tell you, birds hide the sign, their signs from, from those that aren't observant on their birds. The birds that are in the cage, you feed, you water, you go back, you go forth. You know, you have about 16 things at least on your mind, <laughs> but you know, and so, you, you know, and, it, and it's easy to do, I've done it, but it's one of those things where the more observant you are with the birds, birds show signs of illness. They either become depressed, they don't perch as they normally do. They don't eat as they normally do. And these are early signs of disease. And, and that is one way that you can pick up on signs that show disease. I have people where I'm treating the bird and they'll go like, well, doc, it's 98%, uh, it's, it's not 100% normal. Well, my goodness gracious, only 2% and, you know, um, but they know that that bird is not the way it should act. And so by weighing the bird on a daily basis, there is a daily fluctuation of weight. Um, and, and one thing that will help reduce that is, is um, weighing it at the same time. It's not going to prevent it because the bird could have just eaten. Uh, it may not have eaten. It could have had water. You just don't know what was going on. Uh, and that there is a, a fluctuation of weight. <clears throat> what it gets down to is having a, a, a range of uh, having a range. What's its a high weight? What's its low weight over time? Okay. A week, a month, a year averaging that out and then that's what the normal weight is and the range and and um and and then also feeling the bird if you can feel the pectoral muscles that's over the keel uh the chest muscles of the bird those are uh involved in the flight of the birds um if they are uh conditioned where where at the keel, they're, they're kind of coming down over the keel um, in, in, a, in kind of a, a rounded area. That is uh, the way the bird should, should feel. Uh, and if, it, if all you feel is the keel, that's a bird that is very underweight. So with, with that in mind, um, you, you look for uh, the bird's uh, body condition, if it feels like it has good muscles, because the feathers can hide that. The feathers can hide that. But if it has good muscles, then that's, that's, that's excellent. Um, and, and that just goes along with the weight. Um, but don't, don't think too much about the weight fluctuation uh, unless you have a trend where it just continues to go down. Or continues to go up and it just gets very over conditioned, making it susceptible to lipomas or 
are uh, uh, xanthomas. Uh, uh, so you don't want, want that to occur. And certain species are more per, uh, Amazons, uh, rose-breasted cockatoos, something like that. So, um, so, um, so that's, that's what we're looking at there. And, and then also, usually if you have an, uh, an issue uh, uh, that's, you know, saying, well, is it, is this really a problem? Um, many times birds will, uh, with their clinical signs, they're not going to only show one clinical sign. They're going to show more than one clinical sign. It's not like, well, the bird doesn't appear to be eating, but is it acting normally? Is the stool normal? Uh, the bird seems a little depressed, but is it eating? Again, and usually if, a, if you have a bird that is sick, there's more than one, one condition that's abnormal. If it's sick and it's not eating, then usually it's depressed or lethargic or, or something, uh, it's not as interactive. Uh, so look for more than just one thing if you have a, a concern. But as far as weight, that's what I would, I would recommend as far as getting a range over time and then getting a, an average of that to kind of determine, but very good. Okay. Would, would a 15 gram uh, weight fluctuation for an Amazon, as far as like, if we are to apply that to like human weight, would that be like five pounds for like a woman? <laughs> uh, well, it, it just depends, uh, you know, if you're talking about, uh, you know, uh, kind of a, uh, a spectacled Amazon or white okay, front right, Amazon yeah. versus a, uh, you know, a yellow nape or something like that, that may be, uh, you know, very large or a mealy. But um, if you, if you, if you, and then what you have to look at that is in context. Uh, you know, like I said, did, when was it weighed versus when was it weighed before? It was 15 grams today. Well, it's, it's, you know, gain 18 the next day, you know, it, it, it's, 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 uh, it, it's dependent. It could be if you lost 15 today, 10 the next day, five the next day, you see what I'm saying? If, if you have a, a downward trend, then that is problematic. But if it's, you know, if it's fluctuating, that's why I say get the range and then get the average uh, over time. But that's, that's one of the things that, um, if you, if you measure vital signs, if you measure your blood pressure or you measure your heart rate or you know something like that and you do it all the time, you'll see those fluctuations and you may, whoa, what's going on here? And then it's like, well, let's, let's do it, you know, and kind of average those out. So yes, it could be, but you have to put it in context. Is this just a one spot, you know, and how does this relate to the rest of the birds, general behavior, condition, habits, you know? Yeah. That's another reason to keep a little uh, pen and paper uh, near your uh, weight scale so you can jot. Yes, it very much so. Here. Yes, yes. It's good to weigh the birds very much. Uh, uh, I have a number of owners that do that. And uh, that that's very good to to determine what the uh, their overall uh, health is. All right, and then uh, so our next question comes from uh, Sandra, uh, adopted severe macaw that's two years old. Uh, oh, uh, sorry, adopted ha has had the severe macaw for two years, but it's twenty five years old, and it's on, on a pelleted diet um, and and plucks um, her poop smells and so they've tried uh clavamox three times the smell returns four weeks later they've tried uh doxy uh cycline mm -hmm. recently the smell returns any thoughts on medicine uh maybe two back-to-back -back dosages of meds uh, also her crop fills up with air when excited blood work didn't show anything so just wondering if you have any insight on what's going on there well um <clears throat> the you know, again, what you um, you look at is a situation of um, 
the the poop you you know the, the that the stool smells and so that's that's uh, somewhat abnormal for the bird the one thing that you say she's on a pelleted diet um the the uh, uh a lot of times the color if you have a change in color if you have a change in smell it's uh, uh often directly correlated to what you take in okay and so always think about oh the the color's different well what did it eat you know what did i feed it um could that have changed the color of the stool um the other is the smell uh has it been eating something different that would have caused it to smell different if not um then then the, the possibility uh, you look at is that it could be some type of a gastrointestinal issue, such as what uh, bacterial infection. That's what antib antibiotics, antibiotics uh, do is to treat uh, bacteria and you're looking to treat bad bacteria, not good bacteria. We have a lot of good bacteria and birds do in their GI tract to help with the digestive process. Uh, the microbiome, uh, just love that term, right? The microbiome. And so with this in mind, um, is there a bad bacteria causing it? Well, you have, you said blood work. The blood work was normal. Well, it doesn't appear that there's a lot of inflammation uh, occurring uh, if it was a bacterial infection. Uh, that was associated with this. Um, and so therefore it's going to be difficult to see uh, and, and if you don't have a lot of inflammation, um, then it would it, there's possibility of a bacteria um, underlying bacterial cause to this, but it doesn't appear to be be hurting the, the any of the tissue to inflame it okay and so um and that's what we call enteritis enteritis is the inflammation of the the, the intestinal tract so with that in mind um that may be why you're not getting any results because it's not really the, back, the, the antibiotics aren't really treating the underlying cause. Um, one thing that you can do is the, uh, uh, you know, the veterinar your veterinarian, uh, the possibility of a, a, a fecal gram stain, just to get an idea of what the flora is in the fe fecal material, which can be correlated to what is within the the GI tract uh, or the intestinal tract, or even a culture to see if they can identify any possible pathogen, a cloacal culture, to see if there's a, a possible pathogen in there um, with that. Uh, the other, the other uh, point you can say, well, that's, and so with a culture, you know, there's a possible pathogen there uh, although it's not showing up on the complete blood count, then it's possible that you, you could identify the, the specific antibiotic that would be effective in treating. As I always say, just treating with an antibiotic is um, a hope. We hope that this antibiotic is effective. The bacteria may eat the antibiotic that you're treating the bird with like candy. It could eat it uh, and say, I'm resistant to this. This does nothing to me. That's the problem that we're, we're facing. We are, as humans, you hear about antibiotic resistance. Um, that's where antibiotics just aren't effective in treating the bacteria. Uh, so that's why our culture and sensitivity come in place. You culture, you isolate the organism, and then you treat with the, the antibiotic that it is effective for. Um, and that is that makes the treatment response so much better. Now, 
when you <clears throat> when you um, uh, it, it is as far as the the other side of the issue. Well, what if it isn't uh, a bacteria? What if it isn't bacteria? Then there's it could be just the digestive system is with what it's being fed and the pellets that it's eating. It may just have this this odor to it. So you may want to try to change the pellet mixture, uh, the pellets, or, or feed it something different uh, that may, may uh, cause, a, you know, may, may resolve the issue. So this is when you may want to try to feed another pelleted uh, product. Um, and the other, it, Point that you may want to try is something like a um, uh, probiotic uh, that may help, and that was uh, something like the Benabac gel is one one product that uh, you may want to try. So that's that's a good question on that. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. This one comes from Susanna. Uh, my 14-year-old Indian ringneck has an abscess inside her upper beak, and that wait, mass. Wait, 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 wait. Has a what? Uh, has an abscess inside the upper beak. Abscess inside the upper beak. And that that mass goes a bit deeper under her right eye, which was shown on a CT scan. Mm. So it also has been taken from that abscess, and it appears to be a mycobacterium uh, and some other bacteria. We've started antibiotic treatment, which is, okay, uh, clarithomycinum. Does that sound, am I feeling that word? Um, for six months. Um, from your experience, is it possible to cure her from that bacteria so that the abscess, um, the abscess will not get any bigger? Or should the avian vet try to operate and remove the interior of that? And to add, the CT scan showed some uh, lytic, lytic, lytic changes in the mm. bone structure around the abscess and not sure what that means. So that was really okay. Funny. Okay. Okay. Well, if it's, if you're, you're correct. Okay. You have an abscess in the, uh, in the oral cavity in the upper, upper part of the oral cavity that extends close up to toward the eye through the sinus area. Okay. So that's what I'm, I'm, uh, envisioning right now and so with that um, you have all of these sinuses well you have only one sinus in birds the infraorbital sinus it has many many what they call diverticula so you have many uh, pockets of the and it can even extend into the beak so you have this very extensive sinus network in birds it's it's all and, and then it goes down to the cervicocephalic air sac. It's all upper respiratory. Now, so this abscess is in this area and it sounds like you have a, a fantastic um, veterinarian that you're working with, CT scans, you have lytic areas. Lytic means that the bone is getting eaten away, okay? The bone is dissolving around that abscess. So that's what lysis means, lytic. So that abscess is, is causing the bone to dissolve around it. So that's what it's showing some signs of. Um, and so it gets back down. It appears that you have uh, identified um, one of the major culprits and you said mycobacteria if I'm not mistaken, is that correct, Laura? Myco, M-Y-C-O, bacteria? Uh, my, uh, M -Y -C -O bacteria, bacteria. Okay. Mycobacteria is um, uh, actually uh, a, is tuberculosis, TB, okay? And, um, and there's uh, some different forms uh, or different species of uh, mycobacterium that affect birds. Um, and, and your veterinarian uh, should be informing you of all of the, the issues that are uh, associated with mycobacteria. Um, it is um, considered 
a zoonotic where it can transfer from birds to humans, although there isn't any published report of that ever happening, but it is something that is, uh, should be um, known uh, by the owner. Um, and also, if it is in fact mycobacterium, um, the, 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 the specific type of mycobacterium, uh, we use the, the Jewish hospital out of uh, Denver, Colorado. Um, they're very good at uh, typing the, 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 the type of mycobacteria. Or uh, just in, in, in general terms, we call it avian TB or tuberculosis. And and it can it can it can form these 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 abscesses or or, or what we call granulomas, and it, it and it can disseminate throughout the body. It can be treated. It can be treated, um, and you have the bird being treated uh, for it. Uh, however, uh, I do not. Uh, and, and and the one. One point about uh, avian mycobacterium, if you do treat it, um, it has to be treated for an extended period of time. Uh, you say at least you say six months, it, uh, it may take longer um, for that. And even if you get to where the bird is not showing any clinical signs, then um, is there's no, I, I would not ever for one of my patients ever tell the owner that we will completely resolve that, that uh, case, uh, you know, completely resolve that, that infection. Um, I have one case that uh, identified and the owner was a nurse and um, it was an Amazon and we treated that bird uh, and she knew all of the issues and we treated that bird. She treated it every day for five years, okay? And the bird survived it well. Uh, we could not find any evidence of the, of the uh, bacteria uh, after five years. The bird lived another 10 years. So 15 years after the initial diagnosis and then it returned and it returned with mycobacteria. You know, it was older. The immune system wasn't the same as it was before. And of course it, it was more susceptible to anything that was within that body. And unfortunately we weren't able to clear that uh, organism um, even after five years of treatment where she treated it every day for five years. And you think treating for every day for 10 days is, is rough? How about that? Yeah. So it's a, it's a very uh, serious disease condition and um, one that uh, you can treat. The birds do uh, respond to treatment, but it's, uh, you know, as far as, uh, completely resolving and, and, and clearing the bacteria from the bird, I, could, I, would, I would say that um, that's not likely or, or it would be, it's something that, uh, how do you want to say it? I, I just don't believe it, it uh, is possible, okay, with the current treatments that we have. And as far as surgery for the, the abscess, um, that's a, that's a very vascular area. Um, and I'm not sure, um, that it's, um, uh, and it would be a very risky surgery. And I, I don't know how effective, uh, that would be, you know, you have the CT scans and the veterinarian that you just, that you're going to seem it appears you under excellent care. So they would be one that would be able to assess the, the complexity and magnitude of that, that abscess. And, uh, but anytime you're doing, doing any type of uh, surgery in the sinuses, it's, it's very vascular, very, a lot of 
a lot of, uh, as you can well imagine with the blood supply into the sinus, uh, sinus area. Oh, so there you go. Okay, um, this next one's come from Shelly. A concern is with an older Amazon who seems to have a lazy eye. Uh, his detail, he, I'm sorry, his default position is to close it, but he opens it when he's, uh, when stimulated or on high alert. Um, as a background, he also has splayed legs and has only recently been put on a healthy diet. So what's going on with this Amazon with the lazy eye and splayed legs and now he's on a better diet? Well, um, <clears throat> the, it, it just depends on, on as far as the, the, the lazy eye. I think that um, it, there with the, the splay leg, I don't know if it's an older bird, if it's a, a bird that with an unknown history. It says older bird, yeah. Yeah, that it could have been uh, injured somewhere and there could have been some type of a, uh, an issue with just the, the, the function of that eye. Um, so so it, it could just be something where it just doesn't function as properly as the other uh, normal under normal circumstances. I think I think uh, overall you get a, a nice health exam on the bird. You get a um, you get an ophthalmic exam to see if there's anything uh, the cornea, the, the, the globe itself, if the, the eyes functioning, uh, and there's no abnormalities with the, the eye itself. And that uh, even if it's lazy, the problem that we have mostly uh, isn't necessarily with the, the lids that may be um, not open as much as they should be, but the ones that don't close, okay, where it keeps and where they can't close the eye where there may be some kind of neurologic damage that affects the function of the, the, the lids and they don't, they don't moisten that, that uh, surface of the eye. And then, and then um, that, that happens. And uh, you get uh, ulcers on the, uh, the, the eye and you get a dry eye. So, uh, and you can get that if you, if you don't have normal uh, lacrimal um, uh, production uh, or or tear production in the eye, but um, but as far as the lazy eye, it could just be uh, due to some uh, former trauma, and in in really the eye could be fine. But if you get that that exam and see um, you know, what the results are, if if everything's uh, normal, uh, nothing abnormal, then uh, it should be fine. It just, it just will have that. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's see. And then Amy has an umbrella cockatoo that had a uh, uh, de des 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 Desilorin. Thank you. Desilorin uh, implant two weeks ago due to a prolapse, uh, which is believed to be hormonal in nature. How do you determine if prolapse is actually hormonal? And not due to other conditions such as straining from constipation or in, impact. Well, uh, that is uh, really a, when you when you determine if they're <clears throat> um, behavioral uh, or if you're you're looking at any type of uh, uh, situation where it could be a disease process. Um, that's when you go through how we determine whether it's hormonal or not is we do a, a, an examination similar to if um, feather pick, you know, feather destructive behavior is, is behavioral. Is it behavioral or is it due to, uh, or self mutilation it, or is it due to a, um, a disease condition? And so that's when you get the, the animal examined, you, uh, you know, if you have a hypermotility in the intestinal tract, which could be due to, say, uh, bacterial infection um, or uh, enteritis, as we were talking about earlier, or you have um, possibly parasites, uh, gastrointestinal parasites, you, you, you check for those. Um, you, you get a, a blood sample. That's why, see what's going on in the body. 
That's what the blood sample does. See what's going on in the body. Um, and if the blood sample, uh, your, see, your complete blood count, your plasma biochemistry is normal, you, you don't have any intestinal parasites, there's, there's uh, no evidence of uh, uh, gastrointestinal gastritis um, uh, or enteritis, I'm sorry, um, then, you know, it, then what you're, you're left with is what is the, the primary cause and then you look also at the, at the um, type of bird, the, the species of bird, you say it's an umbrella cockatoo, cockatoos, whether it's a Moluccan umbrella, they commonly have these prolapses that are behavioral, hormonal in nature. And, and, and so, so that is one of the possibilities. If it isn't a disease condition, then it then you go down into the 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 uh, aspect of hormonal, and um, that's um, that's a lot uh, more difficult to treat. Thankfully, we have the desilorelin implants. Uh, unfortunately, the desilorelin implant, but depending on birds. It may work for two weeks. It may work for two months. It may work for six months. We just don't know in each individual bird as far as how well it's effective in reducing the hormones that may, may predispose the bird to this cloacal prolapse. We just don't know how long they'll last. Um, and so, so um, the, the optimum is this a female or not, uh, Laura? Was this a female? Uh, or male? A lot of times they're they're female. Yeah, it doesn't say that the, the, the yeah. yeah. Sex, uh, well, I, I know in particular one one bird that we uh, we had Dr. Avery Bennett here, uh, and and we're fortunate to have him here at LSU for uh, a few years before he retired. Um, and he was arguably in my book, uh, the best avian surgeon in the world. Um, and he did an ovariectomy uh, in a, uh, a cockatoo. Um, and that's way out of my league. He's a board certified surgeon. Um, and in uh, the ovary is at the very uh, front, uh, right next to the kidney. And there's a lot of major vessels like the aorta and renal arteries and, and things of this nature that you, if you, um, um, it, you know, make a, uh, you cut those arteries, uh, the bird, it, it's just over. Um, but he removed the ovary on this, this, this uh, cockatoo that was having this chronic prolapse and that solved the problem. And solve the problem. So these are hormonal in nature. Um, unfortunately, uh, the removing the ovaries is um, a, a very is is a, one of the riskiest surgeries around, and only the the the, the most highly qualified surgeons um, would be. Um, and, and I don't know since Dr. Bennett retired who would who would even do that surgery at this point. Um, but nonetheless, we do have the desilorelin implants and, and that may be, be effective. Okay. Yeah. And, and it was confirmed a female, Amy, Amy. Mm -hmm. it. So, yeah. Um, target there. Um, okay. Uh, Cynthia has a, a blue and gold macaw, uh, 29 years old with watery stool, not urates. Watery stool, be, uh, has been going on for a while and it was treated with a, oh, uh, the bird was being mis uh, was being treated for a misshapen egg that was higher up in the cloaca and another one in the same, at the same time. She eventually passed both eggs, but since then I think she uh, it feels extremely warm um, to her. Um, wondering if she's running a low grade infection or something that, let's see, um, they said, uh, is it true their temps are higher than ours? Birds temperatures are higher than ours. Um, should, uh, should, should a white, uh, a white count be done. I guess uh, white is that mm -hmm. right? yes, yes. Bird bird body temperature is about 106, 107 Fahrenheit. 
So yes, they're higher than ours. And this is uh, this good because bacteria don't like really that high of body temperature. That's why when birds get sick, they fluff their feathers because they don't, you know, we don't take their temperature, body temperature, because we know it goes down. Birds cannot dissipate heat. I've, I've mentioned that before. Uh, heat is much more um, problematic in birds than any cold uh, is. Uh, and uh, of course, if you, if you get cold, when the, you know, you, the birds need to acclimatize to that um, um, outside uh, below 50, but um, birds cannot take temperatures uh, over 90 degrees uh, very long or in direct uh, sunlight unless, unless there's air movement and shade and, and uh, they can dissipate heat. Uh, I, always, I always mention that. Um, but uh, nonetheless, yes, I, I believe that uh, this would be a perfect example of why you would uh, do a complete blood count. And uh, also with the, with the um, increased urine uh, that uh, a uh, serum biochemistry panel would be, be uh, helpful in trying to assess uh, what's going on. Um, and then Margaret has a uh, approximately a 15 year old blue front um, rescue. It's not sexed, uh, fully flighted, um, unremarkable avian lab. So I uh, wants to eat planter dirt, however. Um, let's see, uh, forager in food bowl, Harrison pellets are a treat, Lefebvre advocates a treat, but daily new to berries, but daily is the new to berries, um, some rowdy bush and fruits and veggies. Concern is about the dirt seeking and the tr uh, tree wood chewing, almost ingested uh, ingestion behavior. Uh, could the bird have a mineral deficiency? Needs frequent beak trimming despite uh, balsa toys being given. And um, let's see, it says again, labs WNL. Within normal limits. Yeah. Um, so uh, um, the, the, uh, the, the diagnostics appear, the diagnostic test results appear normal. Um, and it, uh, so it's, it, it seeks um, dirt, soil, um, and, and geophagia is what that's called, I believe. Soil eating. Uh, so anyway, um, the, the, the possibility that there is a possibility, um, it appears that it is uh, uh, kind of a, a, as far as the, the diet, this appears fantastic um, that uh, it's getting fed. So nutritionally, it, it should be um, receiving uh, what would be considered uh, kind of a normal um, uh you know, it's normal um, requirements. Uh, however, each individual is different. And so yeah. to try to overcome that, I would say, make sure that you have a mineral block in the, uh, the cage um, or its enclosure. Uh, and, and again, the mineral block, it's not gonna go and eat a chunk off of it every day, but it's there if it uh, wants it. And, and just like a cuddle bone, or something similar in a budgie cage. Um, you know, make sure that the bird has that in there. Um, you can also uh, provide a, a, a multivitamin. I know uh, since Lefebvre is sponsoring this webinar, I'll uh, give a shout out to uh, the Lefebvre has a, a nice multivitamin that you can use as per directions on the container. And Necton um, uh, has a, uh, is a good, vitamin that I recommend. So um, that's what I would, I would say um, with the knowledge that the bird has checked out well uh, with the uh, examination and diagnostic test. And then uh, Kim has a yellow, ye uh, I'm sorry, a yellow nape and her poop is normal, but sometimes they see cloudy urine. And why would that be? What would cause cloudy urine? Cloudy urine could be uh, due to uh, an increase or uh, what you're seeing is uh, uh, urate crystals within the, uh, the urine. Um, and sometimes you'll see it as a kind of a, just white, uh, white 
uh, portion to the urine. Um, but uh, you, you, the, the urates could be, you know, the uric uh, acid uh, crystals in that could be increased uh, at that. Also, depending, as you know, uh, the stool um, is, is uh, mixes with the urine in the cloaca. And uh, so depending on what the bird eats, how long the stool is within, although there's kind of two separate compartments, it, it, it can mix within the um, uh, proctodium. Um, uh, and so it comes from uridium and corporadium, the corporadium from the, the, the intestinal tract and the, the, the uridium from the uh, uh, urinary tract and then, then within the proctodium. Uh, mix and so uh, whatever's within that stool and if it's in there for an extended period of time can cause the the uh, urine portion to be a little bit more cloudy um, as opposed to sometimes if uh, the bird's just going to urinate and there's not a lot of fecal material uh, it hasn't held it well if it's excited or something and then it just uh, defecates uh, urinates uh, that it may be more clear uh, on that. So those are a couple of reasons uh, to uh, that that would be the, the case. Okay, um, I believe that is all we, that was great, as always. Already? Yeah. My goodness, Laura, we just started. I know, I know, it, it, that, that <laughs> flew by, like flew by fast. But the good thing is you'll be back with us in April. So we'll, yes, we'll have another, yes, yes, another yes. fantastic session uh, next yeah. month. So. Um, Great questions again. I tell you, wow, A plus on that. Every time, I I, I, I learn and I learn new pronunciations and I learn new, you know, new new uh, avian medicine. Yeah. And, w and L uh, within normal limits. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you on that. So I'm going to announce uh, today's giveaway winner, um, and I'm going to play the the product um, feature video for that. And I also just wanted to. Uh, Let's see. So we'll see you next uh, at, at the end of next month, end, end of April. And um, as we head into next week, uh, next Friday, we just give a sneak peek. We, we have uh, Dr. Scott Eccles is, is going to rejoin us. He oh. gave us, uh, yeah, we were on with him uh, a while ago. He, he gave a fascinating presentation on his, uh, um, his avian anatomy research project. So um, oh. This this one you, you definitely want to tune in and also I, I highly encourage you to to, to watch the video um, on the YouTube uh, the looking for YouTube page of, of this the previous webinar uh, where he introduced this fascinating um, project that that you know it, it's going to help advance AV medicine. When you say this this thing is pretty groundbreaking, um, Dr. Eccles, uh, and, and you learn all you learn about uh, avian anatomy in a way you never thought you would ever like be. Yeah. It's just amazing. Dr. Um, Eccles is amazing. Yes, he is. Recommended highly. There we go. Okay, so make sure you tune in uh, next Friday for that. And um, I'm going to try my screen share and let's see how this goes. Uh, did I did I actually mention who won today? I'm sorry. Yeah, who won? Who's I did not number? mention the name. Um, Okay, today's winner is uh, Hansi uh, Glan. So uh, welcome um, th this product into your household. Hopefully your bird will, will enjoy it. And uh, let me do my screen share. So congratulations, uh, Hansi. Um, there we go. Uh, I, I think I'm gonna uh, play the video of- uh, Wasn't it Sunny Orchard last time or something? It was, and to this time though, it is, um, it's going to be the, uh, Premium pellets. Mm. Hello. Got and that's sorry. pellets. And I love this video so much because Arroyo um, this, this found the bag and before uh, Dr. Lamb had a chance to I open it for a little bit, just for a moment. And when I came back, Arroyo was not on his tree stand the way that he was supposed to be. And instead, he was over here on my desk where the pellets were. And you can see that he helped himself already. He chewed a nice hole in the side of the bag and got some pellets he out. He took the whole bag as like a foraging dust. opportunity. So <laughs> I think that um, Arroyo did a very good demonstration here of what he thinks about these particular pellets. And, you know, I didn't get to film him the way that I might have liked, 
but that's okay because he Guilty, just showed right? himself Guilty to the bag and uh, proved that these pellets are pretty good. So there you go. And that can be fed as a daily diet. That's the, uh, the premium pellets. There we go. A royal cotton in the act. Um, that's what we're going to be saying out to you, Hansi, as well as another Lucky Book product of your bird's choice. So on that note, I am going to sign off and walk, uh, wish everybody a very fabulous weekend. Enjoy that great weather in your parts, uh, Dr. Natoli. I got it's equally sunny weather here, so I'm, I'm excited. It's always beautiful in California, right? Well, sometimes. But always. Not always. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Have and a great week. Have- Thank you, everybody. Y'all were fantastic. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Everyone have a great weekend. All the best to you and your flock. And everyone stay safe. Till next time. Bye. Bye.